If anybody has any questions, definitely stop me and let me know during the middle of this. It's totally fine. We're going to go over a few of the deals that Tim has done and what his analyzations look like. And he's normally here. He has another commitment tonight. And then we'll go over some that I've done and also some that just other people have done. So clients of mine, um, other people that were kind enough to send over their analyzations and what their long term was. So this is Rentometer and they give you a nice clean report like this, but it gives you what the average and the median rent in the area would be and tells you where the rents are for the area. So this is a pretty reliable way to figure out rents. And really before we talk about anything further, if you don't analyze a deal, you're really just looking at what the rent is and what the mortgage is and saying, oh, okay, great deal. You know, and I don't invest that way. I want to plan for the unseen stuff. So vacancy, repairs, maintenance, all the costs that I can count on and stuff that I maybe can't count on to happen consistently. And with the rentometer, it gives you a good idea of what your income might be. So this is what the rent should probably be for the area. Doesn't mean that's what it is now. So you have to make a good deal. And if the rents are low, that's an easy way to make the deal better. So let's say it, the rents right now are 1400 bucks. You know that rents in this area for this size unit that's in good shape can be 1850. So you can get the tenants out of there that are in there or increase their rent and make it a better deal. So as it is, it's not a great deal. And I'll have a good example of that. So this is one that Tim is working on right now. And I actually found this for him off market. The monthly income is pretty low right now because these are their current rents. So their current rents are 1600 and 800 with a few dollars added on there. The monthly expenses of what he's going to be paying makes it a losing deal. So he's losing money in this case. He's losing $126 a month if all the expenses that he planned on keep up. So the purchase price is $295. The after repair value with the work he's planning on doing, $330. The loan amount will be $236. Down payments, $59,000. It's amortized over 20 years. So he's using a commercial loan in this case. That's his interest rate. So monthly principal and interest payments about 1600 bucks. He, if you just did it by this is the mortgage payment and this is the rent, would be looking like he's making money. But he's smart enough to know that with rental properties, there's other expenses on top of the mortgage. There's water, sewer, trash. There's possible vacancy. There's possible repairs there's possible capital expense. And he accounts for that in this analysis here. So the only way he's making income in this property is rent, which is pretty typical in rental properties. His expenses, he has a really good system down, so, and I'll talk about this later, everybody needs to figure out their own numbers, but his vacancy is very low. because He has a great property management <coughs> system down, all of his properties are in one area, so if he has a vacancy, he fills it really quickly. It's him and his wife managing. He's taking care of everything right, right away. His capital expense, he has budgeted at 5%, which is putting away about $114 a month. Insurance is $150 a month. Property taxes, in this case, aren't escrowed with the mortgage because it's a commercial mortgage. So he needs to put away for this. Repairs. He has a great repair man and a great system again, so his repairs are pretty low. He's only budgeting $70 a month for repairs after the renovation he's gonna do. So he's gonna hit a lot of this right off the bat. Water, sewer, and trash. In Minneapolis, you're typically 150 to 175. He's got it at 160 just to be safe. Again, principal and interest is 1600 bucks. And we're just going to go over a few examples first, and then I'll go over how you end up at this. So his total initial equity is $94,000. He bought for $295. He's got $59 in it. The after repair value went up a little bit. Gross rent multiplier, which is uh, something people use to value properties. 
is 10.81 here. Annual income to expense ratio, the 2% rule. So that's hard to meet anymore. This almost meets the 1% rule as is without renovating it and raising the rents. So as you can see, as is, it's not a great deal. But if we look at what he's planning on doing with the place and what he knows he can get for rents. So if we remember our monthly income was 2,200, what the rent should be, it's at 3,580. So his monthly expenses didn't change at all, but his monthly income changed quite a bit. He's gonna do some renovations on it, so he needs a little more cash, he needed 15,000 down plus or he's putting more down in this case, it looks like. 20% uh, down. Oh, sorry, he's financing the renovations in this, so that's why his down payment went up. So, the purchase price in this was 295. He's rolling in the renovations to this. Come in, grab a seat. And that's why the purchase price went up quite a bit. So his total loan is for that amount minus $70,000. The ARV with his renovations went up to about 425. So he's got a lot more equity in this property now. And as you can see, the monthly cash flow went from negative $200 a month, which is not a good deal. Don't do that. Don't buy real estate just to buy real estate. Um, $722.83. So great deal now. Cash on cash return, 12%. The net operating income is NOI, you know, that's his operating or yearly operating income. And then the cap rate, this is what the property would return if it was paid off in full. So at 355,000, it's NOI is 31,000, the cap rate would be almost 9%. Again, it's amortized over 20 years. This is a commercial loan, so a different loan. I'm assuming he's got a five or a seven year balloon, which he'd have to refinance this. I don't know for sure, because he's not here. But again, he accounted for certain expenses. And they jump up a little bit when you're making more income. So you put a little bit more away. Your capital expense budget's about $180 a month. His insurance didn't change. Property taxes didn't change. Repair budget went up a little bit. Water and sewer did not change principal interest changed just a little bit, even with him rolling in the rehab there. So his initial equity jumped up quite a bit by doing a rehab and by the rents going up. So those can both add to your equity. People are gonna pay more for your property if your rents are higher, which is also why you need to look for properties that are under market rents. And it's something that is a good deal for you after you've raised the rents, because if it looks like a good deal on paper, there's a certain buyer out there that's gonna look for the cash on cash return as is. I've worked with buyers that want a good cash on cash return day one, and they're gonna look for something that has a, a higher rent and maybe pay a little bit more for it. They don't wanna do the work themselves. Tim is okay doing rehabs, is okay changing out tenants, is okay you know, working on the property, but. It might take him about a year to get here, so he needs to have the money to fund all this in the meantime. Typically, I look at properties as, what's it gonna look like after the first year and I'm done with all my rehab? So, I'm sure if he were here right now, he doesn't plan on this happening day one. You know, he's not gonna kick everybody out, get somebody in at these new rents day one. It might take him a little bit to do that, and that's okay. It's not a get rich fast scheme. Nothing's gonna change. And the 50% rule assumes that 50% of your income is gonna be used in expenses. Um, I don't use this rule. I'm betting Tim doesn't either, but they include it in the bigger pockets calculator. If you know your expenses very well, you can make assumptions that aren't typical. He knows his vacancy really well in Northeast where he invests. He only invests in Northeast. He has management set up very well in Northeast. It's not outrageous for him to say that his vacancy would be very low. He, he rents out units before they're vacant. So he does the rehab right off the bat. He does the renting. He checks with the tenants when they're moving out. He's gonna rent it before somebody moves out. So when somebody moves out, 
five days, two weeks later, somebody moves in. But that's knowing your stuff and knowing your areas. So, where's my mouse pointer? This is for 1400 Monroe, which is one he worked on for a client. Average rent in the area was 1600 for a three bedroom rental. You can see there's 34 three bedroom rentals. You can see the actual rents of each of these. This is a PDF, so I can't click on these. You can also search by duplex or apartment. You can search house or duplex or apartment on Rentometer and help differentiate the different rents between those. So let's say you're right next to a huge, super luxury apartment complex. Their rents are gonna be higher than your duplex rents will probably be. They're marketing to a different buyer or a different client. So you need to know the difference between there. So that's, I, that's the company he works for, Ilo. This is 25% down for 1400 Monroe. Monthly incomes, $3,300. Monthly expenses are $2,400. Monthly cash flow looks pretty good at 20% down. Total cash needed to do this deal at 20% down is $92,000. Now that might be a lot for a lot of people. So, we're gonna look at it at 5% down too. Total cash needed is 25 grand, much more doable. The monthly expenses are 25.05. Monthly cash flow used as a rental, it's negative $830. So this is why you need to do numbers because what looks like a good deal with a lot of money down might not be a good deal for the, the down payment you're gonna put down. It really depends what are you doing how are you using it? What's your purpose? Total cost of the project here, 338,000. Purchase price, 329,000. It's a list price on this one. And this is just, I'm sure he probably pulled this off of the MLS listing. Mm -hmm. Tenths, months, month, they can stay or go. And there's again the down payment advertised over 30 years, so this is a residential loan. This is a different loan than we were just talking about with commercial. Better interest rate, longer term, different purpose. You're occupying it and they have more security in you occupying it. This is what it looks like. So, okay, the important distinction here. This is 5% down, somebody lives in it. So they're paying $800 a month to live here Worst case scenario, if expenses actually hit, they have vacancy, repairs, capital expense, that's what they're paying to live here. So their mortgage is $1,587.98. So their monthly income would cover the mortgage. So they're living essentially for free unless something bad happens, which you do need to consider that because there might be some repairs that need to be done every once in a while. There might be some maintenance, there might be some capital expense. You could have the unit that lives above you move out. It, it happens. So it's good to have those budgets built in. You could look at this one of two ways. You could say, hey, I'm making 1675, the mortgage is 1587, I'm gonna live for free. Or you could really do it and go through the full analysis and say, I do need to save a little bit of money each month just in case there's a month of vacancy and I have to pay the mortgage. That's why it's important even when you're house hacking to look at the numbers. If you look at this other analysis, now if you've, once you've moved out and you've lived there for a year, so 5% down, 3.5% down mortgages require you to live there at least a year, your monthly income jumps up to $3,350 Cash on cash return is great here because you only put 5% down, so you didn't put down much money. And your monthly cash flow is almost 700 bucks. So you only put down $16,000, but you make 700 bucks a month, which means you have a killer cash on cash return. And you only get so many of these if you're willing to do them. You get essentially two owner-occupied duplexes or triplexes so you get one 5% down duplex loan and one 3.5% down one to four unit loan. So you get to do this so many times and then you're on to this kind of stuff. You, you've got to buy them 20 to 25% down. So I would 
say take advantage of this when you can. Because you live there for a year for 800 bucks, which I don't know who's renting for 800 bucks for a nice two bedroom anywhere. It's just not happening right now. It's probably 1200 to $1,400 in Minneapolis, St. Paul. And then you move out and you're making 700 bucks a month. It's a pretty sweet deal. So these are all deals that are done. And I can't find my way around here. So we're gonna look, at, this is another one that I just sold today. I helped this guy buy this in August of last year. So he bought it for $215,000. Purchase price. Yeah, $215,000. He bought it 5% down, so his down payment was $10,750. His closing costs were split between him and the owner. So he paid 1.5%, which was roughly $3,225. He spent $28,000 on the place, which is, he got a loan to do this. So he spent quite a bit of money on the place. Total project cost was $246,225. So $246, His after repair value, which is what he got today, we, the loan was paid off and he closed today for $274,000. They didn't ask for any closing costs. Quick closing, no inspection, really sweet deal for this guy. So it was a great deal before he sold it. Great cash, he was making 400, 545 bucks a month if he would have lived in it and not moved out. But for him, it just made sense to sell. Again, he made about $30,000. So he had to have about $40,000 to close almost 100% return in less than a year. So 40,000 to close, he walked away with, somebody can do the math for that, that's 20, yeah, 28,000. Is that right? 20,000? Somebody better at math than I am? Close enough. Okay, so he walked away with about 28,000 in a year. So he put in 28,000 into repairs, he put down about $13,000. So that's a pretty sweet deal. Doubling your money in a year, and he had planned on living here in the beginning, but had a different life change and just had to do something different. So we'll also go through a current deal on the MLS. And again, the, I'm using the Bigger Pockets calculator here. Does everybody know what Bigger Pockets is? Awesome. So biggerpockets.com, you get a few free uses of their calculators. If you want to use them on limited times, I believe you have to sign up for Plus or Pro, which is a couple hundred bucks a year. I think Plus is 90 bucks a year or something. The Pro is a couple hundred bucks. I use them all the time. It's worked out well for me, so I'm happy paying them a couple hundred bucks a year. This is one that was, let's see, let me pull this back up. And this is the MLS here. Uh, I know everybody doesn't have access to this, but this is how I find properties. So this is pending now. This just went pending today for good reason. They originally listed it at 237,300. They moved it up to 297,300, which you don't see happen a lot. Um, oh, it went pending at 297. So somebody bid 60,000 over ask. <laughs> <laughs> which happens um, maybe they wanted it for a specific reason so 833 Selby I put the address in there the city state zip code annual property taxes here they're $3,300 and 3340 they have an assessment so they're at 3506 right now I typically ask the seller to pay all special assessments on sale. So in most cases, I assume this is gonna go away unless you inherit it and you can inherit it if you think that's gonna get the deal done. But I'm gonna ask them to pay this. I probably wouldn't pay 60,000 more than ask, but <laughs> it's, it's what happened. So next I'm gonna have to put the purchase price in there. I'm just going to assume on this one that I paid their original asking price. I've never paid asking price for somewhere, 
but I'm going to assume in this case that I'm going to. Typically, I, I ask for, oh, I, I fig, and I do this to figure out my asking price too. I don't just offer less to offer less. I figure out where is this a good deal. So I'm going to put the initial number in there, and we can do this here too. So I'm going to assume the after repair value in this case is 237,300. I could look at some comps and look at the area and assume I fixed it up, as Tim did in his analysis, and really figure out what it would be worth in good condition. And I'm sure it's more than that. But just for simplicity's sake, we're going to say that it's only worth 237,300. So down payment of the purchase price, 5%. Loan interest rates right now are fairly low. They're in the mid fours. I'm going to assume a 4.85, but I'm assuming you can get a little lower than that right now for owner occupied loan. I closed one Wednesday that was 4.5%. So they're pretty sweet right now. Um, typically we're going to use a 30 year loan. So typical residential loan and they have a little info right here. How long do you expect loan term, term to be? 30 years is most common for rentals. 20 or 25 is also common for commercial properties. Depends the types of loan you use. You can put the cap rate in for your area. Why would you use a cap rate on something less than five? They, well, they have an explanation here. It's a unit of measure primarily used in commercial real estate. It's used to compare the return on investment between properties that are paid off in cash. So if you're gonna pay for this in cash, cap rate might really matter for you. But in this one, we're gonna assume we're owner occupying it and we're using a 30 year loan and no cap rate. The gross monthly rent is $3,050. How did I find that? I'm gonna to go to Rentometer here. What are we, 833 Selby? Okay. It's already up. No, uh, it was. When he clicked on it. Oh. oh, there we go. <laughs> I've obviously searched this before. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, Selby six bedrooms, which is two beds and four beds. We're going to look at the four bed first. It's not a five bed. Building type important distinction. It's not an apartment or a condo. It's not in a luxury apartment complex. It's a house or a duplex. Okay, so the median rent's 1950. And we're also gonna look back at what's the two bed rent at? <coughs> and I know that rents might be lower than this right now, and that's okay. Because we're gonna look at what can we raise the rent to when we do a little bit of work to the place. And I didn't get a chance to go in this one, so I'm not sure does it need a lot of work, does it not. I'm gonna assume, just by looking at the MLS listing, that it doesn't need any work. It maybe needs a little bit of freshening up, new paint, new floors, nothing crazy. So the average rent is right at 1300 bucks. So let's see if I did my math right here. So 1950 plus 1300 is 2250. 2250. Well, 3250. 32. Okay, so mine was a little low there. The first analysis I did, I either estimated lower rents, and sometimes I will do that too. If I see that the average is 1300, but the median is 1200, I might say, well, I'm going to look at what I'm gonna get if it's 1200. I like to be conservative in my analyzations and not optimistic. Because if I'm conservative and a deal turns out well, I've done really well. If I'm optimistic and something happens, then I'm out of a lot of money, and that's not good. <clears throat> so let's just go with 3050. Be a little conservative here. Again, water, sewer, and trash are all combined in Minneapolis and St. Paul. You're looking at about 150 to 180 bucks. I'm gonna say the average is a little on the higher side, so I know I could get away with 150 here. 180 would be a little aggressive, but I'm gonna say 170. PMI, private mortgage insurance. Um, I kinda wish Tim was here, because that's what he does for a living, is 
figures out mortgages. It's between 40 and 65 per hundred thousand dollars finance. So we're gonna say 120 here because we're at 230. We're again gonna be a little aggressive. Garbage, water, sewer, and trash are all together in Minneapolis and St. Paul. So we don't need to add garbage in there. So when Other, you do your water, sewer, and garbage for Minneapolis, are you doing it for both the two and four bedroom? Combining? Uh, for the, yeah. Yeah, and that's from my experience and from talking to other people that own multifamily duplexes in general. Their bills are typically 150 to 180. And I found that my bills were, and my first duplex were typically about 150 bucks. But again, I like to be a little high with my numbers. So if something happens, I'm okay. Other monthly expenses. Anybody have ideas for other monthly expenses you might have? Snow. Yeah, there you go. Bad February was bad. Those are surely expenses. So you're gonna wanna add those in. About how much does it cost per time you get your lawn mowed? I don't hire out, but I, yeah, I, I don't okay. care. Anybody have their lawn mowed? Well, I know you are utilizing, you have to sign up for the year. Uh -huh. And it's like, if you do the weekly plan, it's like 26 bucks a week. Okay, and so. Cuts for the year, you know. That's pretty sweet. So we're gonna say $104 a month then. And if you throw snow in there, so we're assuming we're house hacking here, we're doing an owner occupied financing down loan. You're probably not gonna pay somebody to mow your lawn. Um, there's a chance you do. So when you move out, we're gonna this is important to add in there, unless you're gonna come back and mow your lawns, which you can totally do. It doesn't take a lot of time to mow a small lawn in the city. And we'll look at it with and without that. I'm a little higher on vacancy because I'm not as aggressive and business oriented as Tim is managing my own properties. He has a Matterport camera on, walks around, takes a 3D tour of his properties. He and his wife both manage the properties. So they're just a lot more on top of it than I am personally. Vacancy is really low in the Twin Cities right now. It's about 2%. I assume 5%, just assuming that I'm not on top of everything like I should be. Uh, repairs and maintenance, I go for 5%. Uh, capital expenditures, 5% too. This, in my experience, works out pretty well around here. Again, I don't know every other area and what. I think with repairs and maintenance and capital expense, you also need to look at the condition of the property and the age of the property. So if it's a rough 150 year old property that you're not gonna fix up, your repairs and maintenance and capital expenditures might be higher. So important, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, most everything is 100 years old. It's just, we're an old city. So you may have some capital expenditures like replacing cast iron plumbing replacing old knob and tube wiring. And you can choose to do that in the beginning, or you can wait until it causes a problem and do it. So a lot of people try to take care of that stuff up front, which is my preference. But if you don't, you're gonna to need to make these capital expenditure budgets higher. So if you just buy it, turn the key and let it go, you're gonna have some higher expenses. Annual income growth, I know rent's gone up a lot more than this, the last few years. I just don't expect it to continue to go up so much. And again, I think that's probably being conservative, but I just don't think that rent can keep skyrocketing the way it is. It's at 14 to 1600 for two bedrooms in a lot of areas right now. And that's probably getting to the point where people can't pay for it. Uh, property value growth. I again assume really low on this. It, property value growth has been about six or seven percent the last few years. I assume that it's going to slow down to about a normal three percent rate in the next few years. So I wouldn't feel uncomfortable putting three percent there. Expenses growth. You get more expensive every couple of years, right? Mm -hmm. As your, your, everything gets more expensive for you too. Right. So maintenance and repairs and everything get more expensive. Your expenses water, sewer, trash, electricity, maintenance, all that kind of stuff gets more expensive over time. Just parts. <laughs> yeah, everything, everything, yeah. Sales expenses. If you sell a property, you have expenses to do it. 
I assume on the higher end in this too. Realtor fees are typically 6%. I'm assuming here that you're gonna have to pay some closing costs. So we're at 8%. 6% plus 2% closing cost get you about 8%. That's pretty conservative. Assuming right now you're likely to not have to pay closing costs and the buyer's just gonna pay it. So this is a pretty good deal at the number they originally had it listed at. It was listed at 237,300, makes 3,050 a month. Again, we were kind of conservative in that. Monthly expenses are 2440. So monthly cash flow when you don't live in it, because we're assuming a house hack loan, or a, sorry, owner finance, owner occupied loan, sorry, owner occupied. We're assuming you're living in this. So monthly cash flow is pretty good. Would it be better if we put down 25%? Yeah, absolutely. But not everybody has 25%, and a great way to get started in rental properties is to live in one for a year and then rent it out when you're done. That's how I got started. That's how most of the people I know got started. It's, it's really easy to do. Your cash on cash return is amazing with only putting 5% down. Would this be as good with 25% down? No, not at all. But you have to have 25% down to do that. So somebody that's buying this deal for just an investment is gonna make a lot more money per month, but their money's gonna grow slower than somebody that does it just for uh, owner-occupied property. And then another thing too is, while you're living in an owner-occupied duplex, triplex, or fourplex, your expenses are severely reduced. So you don't have all these expenses. Maybe you have, like the previous analysis, $800 a month compared to $1,200 a month. So you've got $400 more each month to throw into a savings account to buy more rental properties or to do whatever you want with. But let's just say you can't owner occupy, you've got a wife and kids, and you can't convince them to move into a two bedroom duplex with you. It just doesn't sound good. So we're gonna edit this report to look at what it would be with 25% down. So good numbers here. This was listed on the MLS originally at that number. Original list price, $237,300. But we'll say we put 25% down, just, in, just for the fun. And that's typically what you're gonna have to put down as an investment loan for a multifamily is 25%. So, cash on cash return, still pretty good. I don't know who pays attention to the stock market in here, but you were doing, we, we did really well the past few years and you were doing well at 8%. I would, you're getting double that on this investment. So you're getting 17%, which means your money's growing twice as fast as it would be if you put it in an IRA. Another good reason to invest in real estate. Monthly cash flow is a little higher. It was about 700 bucks before, if I remember right, $860 a month here. So, you know, a couple of these and you've got some serious cash flow. But you need to put $59,000 down compared to the $10,000 down for the other scenario. It's, there's nothing wrong with anything, but it's just what you gotta do. I'll go over another one on the MLS. We'll, We'll pick one and go over it. And I, I'll kind of let you guys do this too. So what area do we want to look in? Midway neighborhood, St. Paul. Okay, that's a good pick. It's an interesting neighborhood right now with the soccer stadium popping up there. <laughs> so it's right over here. I'm gonna zoom in on that. Not a lot over there right now. Enough. You know, last year you couldn't get away from properties in Midway, but there doesn't seem to be that much available. This one's been listed for a long time. Let's look at this and see why it's been listed for a long time. It's been listed for 151 days. So it's a duplex. It's one bedroom. Oh, that's probably why. One bedroom unit duplexes don't move as fast as two bedroom unit duplexes. Anybody that's paid attention, two bedroom unit duplexes that are a good deal, two bedroom plus are gone almost right away. One bedroom units, just not gonna be there that long. 
and there's a we'll find out why right here. So address. We're gonna put that in the monitor. These are actually the same zip code, so they're fairly close together. But this is a one bedroom. So, average rents about 925. We're going to go with 900. So, we're going to analyze the deal here. I use the rental property calculator. I'm going to start a new report. Five five one oh four, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah, there it is. Oh, that's not the zip code area. I'm curious as to why this has been sitting there for so long too, so this is good. What do we have for property taxes? Thirty four ninety eight. Not abnormal in the area, but a little higher than normal. You can put the MLS number in too. It helps if you're using an agent, it helps your agent find it. If you're if you have MLS access, it helps you just keep track of it. You don't have to. I like to put a photo in. So again, this is branded. This is property of the MLS. I just like to have a picture of the property on the report. If you're showing this to investors, these reports are really powerful because they have really nice layout. And I don't have any partners or investors, but if I was going to, I would do reports like this for them. This is just purely for me. So purchase price here. $224,900. We're going to say the after repair value is 224902 just for simplicity's sake. If we really want to get in depth here, we should look at comps and we should look at recently sold in the area and figure out what something this size with this type of units would sell for or sell for in good shape. Closing costs. So we're going to figure that, again, closing costs are about 3%. Just it. Just oh, it's down here. I'll figure it out real quick. $6,747. So let's split it. Assume we can get the seller to pick up half the cost. $3,373. And $3 Estimated repair cost. I, without seeing a property, like to assume that I'm going to do some repairs to it. So let's say $5,000. That's carpet and paint for probably both units, if that's all it needs. And we're going to assume it, it needs that, because I don't know about you guys, but when I turn my units, I'm almost always painting them. I've seen to be replacing carpet every two or three turns. It, it just happens quite a lot. So I've got two units that are about to be vacant, and we're going to paint both units and replace the carpet in both units. It, it just happens. It's a cost. It's associated with rental properties. I'm going to assume that this landlord didn't do that, and I'm going to have to do that. Down payment, we're going to assume a 5% down duplex loan. Is everybody good with that? We can do anything. We can do 25%. Mm -hmm. Want to go 
Five, interest rate, let's go 4.75. Pretty favorable interest rates right now. We're going to assume we have a 30 year term. No points. It's not an interest only loan. So interest only, well, you don't pay any of the principal until the loan's due. Gross monthly rent, where are we at here? So we're at, let, let's assume 900 to be safe. So 1800. So going by the 1% rule, I'm gonna assume this property doesn't cash flow, but I don't know that until we get through this. I can look at this and my rule of thumb says that the property's listed at 220, the gross monthly rents 1800, probably not gonna do well. If it were listed at 200,000, there might be a chance. If it were listed at 195,000, a better chance. If it were listed at 175, I'm pretty confident that we cash flow. But in this case, probably not. So we're gonna say 170, water, sewer, trash. PMI about 120. Insurance, who has insurance on a duplex right now? About like 1100,000 or 1100. A year? In the midway, too, yeah. Okay, oh, that's sweet. Mm -hmm. We're pretty close to there. So, got 90 bucks. You $90 a month? Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. Where in Midway? Right off um, like Lexington University. Awesome. So just on the border of Frogtown and Midway. Yeah. It's actually very similar to what you're doing right now. Oh, really? Awesome. <laughs> one bedroom units? It's one bedroom, purchase price 173. Okay. 900 in rent. Awesome. Um, so we're not going to do garbage. There is no HOA on a duplex. I personally try to stick away from properties with HOAs. I had a guy speaker a few months ago that only buys condos and likes the HOA because they pseudo manage it for him. So. It's really up to you and your experience and what you like to do or what you're used to. He gets great deals on condos. He has quite a few condo rentals. It works well for him. We're gonna assume that we're gonna do our own lawn maintenance on this because we're living in it. Again, there's no garbage because water, sewer, and trash. The electricity in most duplexes is typically split. Electric and gas are very common to find split. Every so often you find a water split. I was in one the other day where it had two water meters. You almost never see that. You almost always see, in St. Paul typically, like the first ring suburbs of St. Paul, I see it more often than not. Having a remove water meter in St. Paul. Yeah, yeah and you're probably not gonna split it, but yeah, I've seen it probably in 10 duplexes and the whole time I've been looking at duplexes. So it happens, but it doesn't happen very often. One in East St. Paul this weekend I saw, one in South St. Paul, last year I saw. So I see them, but I don't see them often. Vacancy in this area, let's assume 5%. Again, if you're loosely managing it, it could be up or down. If you're strictly managing it and you're staying on top of tenants moving out, and you know, hey, the tenant's gonna move out in May, I'm gonna start advertising it middle of March. In your lease, you have a 48 hour notice for the tenants, so you can bring new potential tenants in there while giving your current tenants notice, you might have a lower vacancy than that. We're gonna assume, let's say this place is, we can see the year bill right here, 1892. We're gonna assume repairs and maintenance at 5%, but capital expenses at seven. We're gonna assume they haven't replaced the furnace and water heater, they haven't updated the plumbing and electrical. Stuff they may or may not have done. I don't use management in proper, most properties. I do in some. My management fees are typically 10%. If I manage them myself, I use Cozy. It collects rent for me. I call a handyman or a plumber or somebody in the area to take care of it. That's easier for me in most cases. Once you get into larger commercial loans, they will not allow you to manage them yourself. So it depends what you're doing here. Let's say this was a 10 unit you're getting a commercial loan with a million dollar loan balance. They're not gonna trust you to manage that. <laughs> they just don't assume that every normal individual has that kind of capability. Not saying you can't, and or that I couldn't, but they won't allow you. Income growth, again, we're gonna go low. Property value growth, 
the typical 3% annual expenses growth. I'd say about 2 to 3% a year. Taxes would be down at quite a bit. Yeah. Well, taxes go up, so let's say 3%. Sales expense, 8%. Yeah, taxes have gone up a lot the last few years. I'm not sure what's going on with the city. They're increasing a lot. That does push your taxes up. Building, yeah, building the stadium in the midway area. That, that was taxes, tax that's right. The only yeah. tax was the utilities. No. Oh, for the. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. I did not know that. It was all yeah. private. Was private. Sure, they'll find a reason. They'll find the use for that So, not our greatest deal tonight. <laughs> monthly income slightly less than monthly expenses, putting the cash flow a little bit negative here. Forever. But by the same token, now we know, and again, just assume one percent rule. Yeah, great. That's been on the market in hundred days. Someone could walk in going, "Hey, I'll pay one seventy five for it. I'll pay one seventy nine nine." Yeah. Now all of a sudden, it meets your one percent rule, and it should just cash flow. That's a really good your... point. So you need to look at all of them this way too. Oh. What What does the number actually work at? So it doesn't work at two two twenty. So they've been on the market for one hundred and fifty days. We're gonna say, yeah, we're gonna make a lowball offer and see what happens. And no one's gonna die if you make a lowball offer. Somebody might be slightly offended. It's not gonna cause global warming to speed up. It's really, nothing bad is gonna happen. Somebody's just gonna say, no, sorry, not taking it. Um, it was a, a bit of time out of your time. It was a bit of your agent's time. Nobody, no one's gonna be in trouble. Let's say we're just meeting the one percent rule here. We're gonna go one hundred eighty thousand. After repair value, we're gonna go with let's say two fifteen. I think it would probably sell at two fifteen in a little better shape. If it's not sold, there's probably something else at play too, other than just the cash flow. But we assume a five thousand dollar repair budget, so we can fix some minor stuff. Oh, I just turned an award. That's it's so <laughs> exciting. So we're not there yet, but we're a lot closer. So a one percent rule didn't really win us anything here. It got us really close, which is why you need to analyze deals. You can't just look at the numbers and not do a full analysis and you really know. And that's also with the uh, both units rented at eighteen hundred, not not house hacking and yeah. nine hundred in one unit. Then you're even and with house hacking, I do an analysis like this, mm -hmm. and then I just assume that I'm looking at the mortgage and saying, well, how much am I really going to have to pay every month? And when I move out, this is what's going to happen. Tim was nice enough to do a house hack analysis, like a move in analysis mm -hmm. and a move out analysis for us. I haven't actually <laughs> ever done that for myself. I've looked at the mortgage and looked at it before and said, okay, well, making 1800 a month, I'm paying. Principal interest is that, but the mortgage payment is a lot higher than that. So negative forty-four dollars a month here. My monthly expenses are a little more than our monthly income. So we again going back to find out how does this deal work. And we talked earlier. Can you turn on the MLS and find a good deal? Most of the time, no. You know. I'm an agent, I'm going to be first to say it. If you turn on the MLS, look at the first deal you see, they're typically not a good deal. If it were that easy, there'd be even more competition than there is. You have to really dig to find a good deal. You have to make quite a few offers. It's, it's a lot of work. It's not easy. But we're going to say 170. Let's see how this works out. I'm just seeing what the numbers just were. Don't think this is going to be a great deal at 170. And this is why I don't love one bedroom units and duplexes. The cash flow is just too low. We're still negative $20 a month at $50,000 less than they have listed. So it might happen, but it's still not going to make money at this number. So, yeah, I. It still depends on perspective, though. Now, to a person going, I'm going to live in that one bedroom. Yeah. I now have a $900 mortgage. That's a good point. Yeah, they have a cheap mortgage. For somebody who's not analyzing deals 
at that number, this might look great because their mortgage compared to their rent is still profitable. We're taking a lot of stuff into account. We're taking repairs, maintenance, vacancy, all the expenses. I would be willing to bet a lot of people out there searching for rental property right now are just taking the, the mortgage and just taking the income and saying, okay, mortgage is a thousand bucks a month, income's 1800 bucks a month, I'm gonna make 800 bucks a month, which I don't recommend doing. And the reason for this meetup, really. <laughs> I would, in from owning and operating rental properties, there's expenses, stuff happens that you can't ever think about. You know, you, people move out, people have legal issues, people cause problems, people bring bed bugs into your rentals. It's all kinds of stuff. I, I've been through about all of it now. Um, cats. cats? Stray cats. Oh, stray cats. Yeah, I actually have that too. I had <laughs> one tenant lived on the bottom floor unit, had like a farm of cats outside of his unit, not in the unit luckily, but he had three cats that were kind of living on the porch there. And they would let him in every once in a while, so it happens. So that was just one we found on the MLS. Again, it's been sitting there for a long time. There's probably a reason why it's been sitting there a long time. We found it out. Do you think maybe that like the garbage and all those fixed costs are too much for that two, I mean, you have two, two bedrooms in that unit you know, basically. It's not a two bedroom, two bedroom duplex with garbage and water. Sure. They might be. And it's an importance of really figuring out what your numbers are going to be. So my, with my experience, most duplexes have about $150 a month in water, sewer, and trash expense. And it doesn't vary too much, but it certainly does vary a little bit. So I mean, that when the cash flow is $1,800 and your expenses are $1,816 like or something, yep. $1,819, like you're just never going to get ahead of that. You know, no. the expenses at 18 and you know, there's just two years in that actually, right? Yeah, and I, and you can make a deal work and a deal can actually work. And this deal just doesn't seem to work at any number that is reasonable that they're gonna take. Because they're probably not gonna take a hundred, well, let's say 150,000. You're also looking at the averages in that same neighborhood for a one bedroom, uh, I'm getting 1050, so. Yeah. Maybe mine's a little bit nicer, maybe I'm getting the high end. Yeah. But that hundred and fifty dollars a month just for that one unit, that would make that would make, make all the difference. Yeah, that would make so. it a cash flowing deal. And I don't assume that I'm gonna get the top of the market rent right off the bat. What did we find on the nine thirteen market? something? Nine thirty eight? Nine twenty four. Yeah, let's say I try to not be optimistic in analyzing properties. I try to be conservative and realistic. And what can I certainly get with no issues? Because I'm not going to run into this deal. I can make this deal work on paper at 220, I'm certain. I'm sure I could say, hey, that actually made money there at 150. The likelihood of them accepting an offer at 150, not very high. The likelihood of them accepting an offer at 220, very high. Let's say oh, I'm gonna make nineteen hundred bucks a month. Which or you said ten fifty? Yep. So what we make the units really nice and this totally could be possible. Twenty one hundred a month. And this comes down to knowing your areas really well. You know the area, obviously that area way better than I do. Because nine hundred a month seem pretty reasonable to me there. In Northeast, I know I can get 1500 a month for two bedrooms. I, I just know it because I've seen it. You know it because you've seen it, you've done it. So you know if this is the right size one bedroom and you do these certain things to it, and I'm certain if you rent it out in June, you're gonna get 1050 for it. If you try to rent it out in January, you, get nine. You're, nine. you might get 900, yeah. Because it's a rough time to rent. And nobody wants to move in a snowstorm. <laughs> so we might say, well, my water, sewer, and trash could be 130. My PMI might drop a little bit, and that's pretty much a fixed cost, but, and I, again, I didn't do any calculation to figure this out. I'm just going off of what I know. Maybe I can get my insurance down to 75. 
This is being very optimistic. Eh, the furnace isn't that old. We're gonna go for five. Or maybe I can do most of the repairs and maintenance myself. Which is a skill, and you need to understand if you can do that stuff or not. <laughs> it's not gonna be vacant, because I'm gonna manage it really well. If you're really good, you get your $50 an hour, and you need to do it for other people. Yeah, no, really, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> next, next. <laughs> 75. <laughs> Let's say, oh, the rent's going to keep going up at the rates that it is. Property value is going to keep going up at the rates that it has the last few years. My expenses aren't going to grow that much. I'll sell it myself. <laughs> Sorry, I had to throw that in there as a real good gift. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, this is a great deal now. At 220, <laughs> making 2100 bucks a month, having lower expenses, I'm making 11% cash on cash return. I'm making almost $100 per unit. So, what wasn't a good deal can look like a really good deal on paper if you're not conservative and not doing your numbers. If you, let's say you didn't even look at this at all, and just said, hey, my mortgage is going to be 1100 bucks a month. My down payment's this. My closing costs are this. My monthly income is this. So I'm going to make $1,000 a month if I move out. It's probably not going to happen that way. Your carpet's going to need to be replaced every once in a while. You're going to need to paint the thing every once in a while. I guarantee there's going to be some sort of maintenance call water-related every once in a while. The toilet breaks or the fridge leaks or something happens. I get some sort of water related call at least once a month. You now they happen and the more units you get the more often they happen. So with a duplex if this is your only property you may be able to take care of all this yourself. You don't need a handyman. You don't need a maintenance man. You can go over there and paint and fix everything yourself but once you get up to 10 duplexes and you're busy at your full-time job, it might be too much to go fix a toilet on your own. And that's when landlords get old and burnt out. Not, I don't want to say old, but just burnt out. <laughs> and, yeah, you look old, yeah. You've had all of these Saturday morning fiascos at your duplex, and you've got 20 of them, and it's a full-time job managing them. I helped a guy buy one last year whose dad managed all of them himself, and he grew up going and fixing roofs and windows and all kinds of stuff. So he can do that, but he knows he doesn't want to do that for good. So yeah, can you leverage your skills in the beginning to make it work? Absolutely. So I would still run your numbers like you weren't going to do any of it, but then do as much as you can on your own. I can't do anything, so I call a handyman to do anything that I want because I I'm just not a handy guy. I, I can figure it out. I have YouTube, but I, I'm going to go the way of paying somebody else to do it, and I'm going to enjoy my, my time doing other things. Yep? Would you ever, like, let's say you were wanted to make an offer. You didn't mm -hmm. want to make the 220. Yeah. Let's say you wanted to come in and make 180. Yeah. Would you ever, since it's on the market, go take a look at it to try and see if you could figure out what is wrong with it, why it's on the market, oh, yeah. while you're doing your, crunching your numbers? Yeah, I, I have gone, I have not gone in properties that I've bought, but I typically go look at them before I put an offer on them, even for myself. And I'd say that you need to figure out what can you do to it? Can you make it nicer? Can you get that 1050 a month rent? Or are the units small and janky and you only get 900? So. I think going and looking at them really makes a difference. And if you don't know this stuff too, you're really relying on going and looking at them and doing the back of the research. And you, you have to go look at them to know. I wouldn't buy things sight unseen for the biggest reason of just running into all kinds of issues. Let's say we bought this sight unseen with these numbers, they worked out great. Let's say we buy it, buy it sight unseen, we made this the offer. There's a gravity furnace in there that needs to be replaced. <laughs> everybody, anybody know what a gravity furnace is or not know what a gravity furnace is? It's a giant asbestos covered octopus looking thing. 
It's huge. They're it's awesome. expensive to get out of there. They're awesome. <laughs> they look awesome. There's no moving parts. No moving yeah, parts. No moving they don't parts. break very easily. But when, when you have to get it out, it's expensive. <clears throat> so we didn't see that. We assumed it. We assumed we wouldn't have to do anything except carpet and paint, but there's $5,000 budget turns into $15,000 budget. The units are small and janky, and it's January, so we're only getting 900 bucks. We're gonna go back to our normal assumptions. Well, let's just stick with these, just to go over a scenario that we didn't look at it, and everything else turns out great. So, we're back to losing a bunch of money. <laughs> so with this one for where is that? This one we're working on right now for Tim. Without seeing it, we wouldn't have known that the entire third story was already finished and there was three more bedrooms up there. We wouldn't have known that you could add bedrooms in both units right here. So it's a, they're both one bed with den on their own and then there's a three bedroom finished upstairs that links to the top story. So the top story right now is a four bedroom with a den. The bottom story is a one bedroom with a den. So as it is, it's not a good deal. But because we went and saw it, we could see that we could add bedrooms. Another one that's in North right now and listed. And it's been listed for a long time. <coughs> This one, I think you probably have low income. Did I not spell right? Oh, I did not spell right. This one, Aldridge, yeah, that's what I was going for. And this one isn't in a horrible, it's in the Camden neighborhood. So is people familiar with the Camden neighborhood? Um, it's not as high a crime as some parts of North. You know, there's, there's parts of it that are pretty nice. This is in the Camden neighborhood, 4130 Aldrich. So we're gonna look at it like it's a market rate rental first, and we can look at it from a section eight perspective. So market eight rent, sorry, market rent is about 1350. Section eight rent, I know for a three bedroom, is 1600 bucks a month. So that's a pretty sweet deal. And I know it's listed, this is going to look at them, it's listed as a two bed, one bath each unit. Now the front of each unit, it's a side by side, is a room and then there's a living room. So there's a room that's not walled off right now, it's just a separate little sitting area. And then there's a living room that I assume was probably, be used, it was probably being used as a dining room and then a living room. So if I went and saw it, I could figure out that I can make each of these units a three bedroom, possibly one of them a four bedroom. So what wasn't a good deal to begin with by just going in and seeing it, I know, and I'm just speaking personal experience. I've been in this one several times. Um, from the MLS listing, it doesn't look very good. It's been listed for 502 days. <laughs> It's not FHA available because it's 100 yards from a gas station, which FHA won't make loans within 100 yards of a gas station. I'm not sure why, but, but they won't make loans within 100 yards of a gas station. So this one doesn't look like a good deal on paper, but by going in it, I realized that I can make each unit a three bedroom. I can make 3,200 a month off of this thing and it's priced at 180. So if we were using the 1% rule, or any of those rules, we already think we're making money. I think I already did an analysis on this one. I'll pop it up real quick for you. So it's gonna cost a little bit of money to make these third bedrooms on each of them. Not free, unless you can do it all yourself. <laughs> but when you're adding a bedroom, bath, mm -hmm. like say if you do a basement unit, I'm, yeah. I'll stay off the ADUs because I know that's a whole separate. Yeah, we're separate actually location. having a meet up on those this summer. I, I've seen a few, There's, they're an interesting breed, but yeah. when you're 
in this in the Twin Cities, when you're adding, say, you add a bedroom, say, you add a bathroom, mm -hmm. three, four hundred feet square feet of living space, or you're just not adding living space, you're just turning a living room or a den into a bedroom. Yeah. Two to three or three to four. How do you how do you gauge what you're going to get out of that? Do you just remarket it as the same living space or X amount more living space with the extra bedroom and re and re redo the numbers, or do you know that by adding a bedroom I can add 10, 20, 30 grand to the, to the uh, price point. If I'm buy, helping somebody flip a house or remodel their house that they're about to sell, I can look at the comps and figure out, okay, two bedrooms here is selling, we were doing this earlier actually, I work with a flipper, two bedrooms in the neighborhood in good shape are selling for 200,000. Three bedrooms in the neighborhood are selling for three hundred or 250,000 with the same square footage. So I, I'm looking at what can I do with this property Am I going to be able to add square footage or just add a bedroom? Mm -hmm. So if I'm just adding a bedroom, I need to look at the square footage as the same. If I'm adding a bath, bathroom's more expensive than a bedroom. I've got a buddy that just adds bedrooms to everything. And it <laughs> works really well for him for what he does with rentals. He does Section 8 rentals. This would, oh, well, this would be right up his alley. And does it make a difference whether it's a basement, attic, or regular living, I mean, first floor, second floor living space? Um, for the ARV? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the basement is not worth as much. Mm -hmm. we're, we're just talking about rentals right here though. So in this, uh, in this scenario, two bedrooms in that area rent for about a thousand bucks a month. Section eight, that is. Three bedrooms rent for about sixteen hundred bucks a month. I want to say two bedrooms might actually be twelve hundred bucks a month. Section eight now. About twelve fifty. Twelve fifty. Okay, there you go. Yeah, you're right. Um, we're gonna not assume we can use an FHA <laughs> loan because I found out you can't on this one. We're gonna assume twenty five percent down. And I wish Tim was here to correct me, but I think the investment duplex loans are about five and a quarter right now. You had your ARV at 175 on that. On this one? Yeah. Okay. I'll it was look confusing me a little. I think I might have. Yeah. Oh. Well. <laughs> wow. You're buying it for a lot more. I was <laughs> analyzing it for lower purchase prices too. So. Yeah. Okay. If it's at 179 now, so we should probably drop the purchase price. When I first looked at this, it was closer to 190. No, we're like yeah, a million zero. seven now. Zero. That's <laughs> yeah, almost zero. Um, I want to figure that out eventually, but thank you. <laughs> so we're assuming we're going to get the added rent by adding the bedroom. And you really have to make a good deal right now, and this is part of the way you make a good deal. You find space to add bedrooms. So put twenty five percent down. This is a a great deal if you want to manage section 8 rentals in that area. I'm not against that kind of stuff and I don't have a problem with it. It might be a little too much for somebody else and that's totally fine. I don't hold anything against anybody for not wanting to manage certain types of properties. Property management in general isn't too hard, but you know there are some things that make it harder. When you're more people, smaller area, it so let's say I have a, an old broker that does Section 8 in North Minneapolis who makes great returns. He'll only do single families because in this case it's a side by side. If there was two three bedroom, a uh, two three, two unit three bedroom, there's people upstairs and downstairs running all over the place. So it could be really loud. It could drive tenants out. He had a duplex with uh, four bedrooms upstairs, three bedrooms downstairs, and it was always complaints from the tenants. So it just depends what you're comfortable doing. This is a great cash on cash return if you add bedrooms. If you didn't go to it, just bought it sight unseen and didn't add any bedrooms. At twelve fifty a month, it's still gonna cash flow at this, but not the same. Another thing you might do is you might assume that because it's a three bedroom, there's more people in it, you're going to have higher expenses. So 
so you really want to play with this stuff, but also know why you're playing with it, because it can operate the opposite way too. You can play with it and make a great deal out of anything, and say, oh, look at this great deal I found, and you know, then you find out. I actually have the vacancy repairs and maintenance and capex pretty high on this because of age of the property where it is and turning it into two, three bedroom units. And the boiler's old on this, the furnace and water heater are newer for the one side, but the other water heater is pretty old. So it's still not a bad deal at market rents for the bedrooms that it has now. Anybody have anything else they want to look at that's currently listed? Or any yeah. ones you've done? St. Paul that uh exact location but it, it went on last week and then had highest and best oh. by like I think Monday so it might be on the pending I see I might have to say it so look at the line northeast uh, uh, um, third street or the one yes. you just yes the one yeah. uh, 26, 26, 33, 7, 7th Street. 7th Street. Oh, yeah. It's our lost, it's lost. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. 6, 6, 8, 7, 8. That's a two-bedroom, one-bedroom. We can do the, the two two-bedroom, which is on the bottom, that one, yeah. Yep. Okay. And what she just said is this is a two-bedroom and a one-bedroom. Yeah. And you can see the price difference in this. You know, the agent that's representing him probably pulled comps and looks at the recently sold for the two bedroom, one bedroom and said, oh, these don't sell for that much. If this would have been a two bedroom and two bedroom, it would most likely be listed more around this. So something important to remember is the seller's job is not to give you a good deal. The seller's job or interest is to make the most money they can. So you need to analyze deals and find the numbers that work for you and then make offers based on that and not hope the seller's gonna do it for you. Because their priority is to make as much money as possible. Duplex here. And we, the one I just sold in St. Paul, luckily it hit the 1% rule and we were able to say in the listing, 1% rule deal. And it wasn't the seller's highest priority to make it a good deal for somebody else. He was looking to make money for himself. And it worked out really well and it appraised that value and you know, it's great when you can put a property on the MLS that's a good deal. It doesn't always happen. So, what do we got here? <coughs> so, I'm going to bet from knowing Northeast pretty well that we're pretty close to fourteen or $1,500 a month rent here. See the proximity to Lowry Avenue here? That's going to lower your rent. So this one, two bed, eighteen hundred. This one, two bed, nine fifty. <coughs> Rents in Northeast are kind of all over the place still because there's a lot of landlords that have been holding on to them for decades, and they might not have kept kept up with the rent. So I'm going to kind of jump out of what I've talked about here and. Just assume that we're gonna get 1,400 bucks a month. Were they pretty big units? Mm -mm, no, no, pretty small units, okay. Yep. Let's see if we can see 1340, so yeah, they're pretty small. Um, the bottom is getting 1,200. Okay. Yeah, so they're already getting close to market, which doesn't always happen. Why you need to use things like Rentometer and Craigslist and Zillow and you know talk any to local landlords. Talk to local landlords. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's tools to do it like Rentometer, but I know from experience owning properties in this area that you can get higher rent than this. I got 1200 bucks a month several years ago for a tiny unit in 
not so great shape. So I know that if I fix the unit up a little bit, I can get 13 to 1400 easy. But you don't know that unless you've owned in the area or you know landlords in the area. So tools like Rentometer are great, but they can't be the final say in everything. Let's purchase price here. $279.9. Okay, we're just going to stick with $279.9. Is it in good shape? <laughs> um, <Sorry>. uh, <laughs> the outside needed painting. Uh, inside was nice. Inside, good floors, um, good paint. Okay. Oh, I think windows needed, needed repair. Okay. We're going to say about $4,000 okay. in closing costs. Um, estimated repair costs, windows need repair. Mm -hmm. I think they could be repaired or, or I they guess all need to be replaced. Oh, I think one, one is fully shut off and from one of the bedrooms. Oh. So that's not ideal. Uh, so that one needs to be replaced. I think, uh, how, do you do yeah. windows? No, but uh, how many do you think there are? Just a rough guess. I would just, I would, would want replace? to replace. Eighteen hundred, about three hundred a window. Okay, I go with four hundred, but okay. I probably pay more than you do. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Not anymore. Yeah. So I've got twenty four hundred for windows. Let's throw in a couple. Let's throw in two grand more. So we're at forty four hundred. Appliances, maybe. Appliances. Mm -hmm. Which ones? Stove and fridge, probably. Okay. Yeah, we definitely want to throw in another two grand. Sorry. Where are you getting your appliances now? I really got lucky when Sears closed and uh, <laughs> I bought four dryers and tried to get in, I couldn't get a good washer, but I got four dryers out of it. So. Yeah, I just bought a washer and dryer <laughs> for a unit. They're pretty nice, but I was at twelve hundred bucks for a washer and dryer. So do you ever do front load washers or only top load? Uh, only top load yeah. right now. Um, uh, I bought Pure Leak because these were cheaper, and they're still good washer and dryer, but they were cheaper. Mm -hmm. So I would if I could get a good price on them. Mm -hmm. So let's analyze this like we're going to live in it. We're going to put 5% down. We're going to get a good interest rate because we're living in it. going to be a 30-year loan, which is why I love residential loans, because they're long fixed terms. Also very safe because they're long fixed rate fixed terms. <coughs> so we're going to assume we're getting 1400 a month here. Just knowing the area, we're going to assume water sewer trash is 170. PMI, we're going to go with 120. Monthly insurance, um, I'm going to go higher than 80. He had a pretty good insurance plan, but we're going to go to 110. This was my, I had, the last insurance I had on a duplex in Northeast started out at 110. It dropped to 100 after a year or two, but we're going to start with 110. Vacancy, again, in Northeast, you've got really low vacancy. In Minneapolis, St. Paul right now, if you're marketing right and taking care of units right, your vacancy is really low but we're gonna stick with 5%. Annual income growth, 2%, property value growth, 3%, expenses growth, three, sales, eight. So, not a bad deal mm -hmm. at that number. I was surprised that I thought it was gonna be lower than that. Um, but sweet cash on cash return, I'll take that over a Roth IRA any day. Mm -hmm. Um, pretty sweet cash flow when you're not living there, especially if you're living close by and can manage it yourself. And even if you're not close by, you can still contract a handyman or a plumber or any sort of repair person to go over there and take care of little issues you've had. Property management, while it's great, and I have a great property manager and I like them, um, I probably would not have them if a commercial loan didn't require that I have property management because it makes your life a lot easier because you don't have to answer any of the phone calls or you don't have to do any of the showings or 
you don't really have to deal with anything except making bigger decisions. It's still active rental property owning. So I talk to my property manager every week. I help make decisions. I had a situation where we have to do some repairs to a unit. He got a quote. I'm going to get another quote to figure out if we can do it for a cheaper price. If I wanted to be completely hands off, I could just tell him get the quote, do it right away. But because I like to have some sort of control over my assets, I, I keep in contact with them on a regular basis. So, yeah, this is pretty sweet. We just pulled this right off the MLS. It's a good deal. We can edit it and see what it would look like if we got them to cover the closing costs. Maybe we offered 270. And this is being a little optimistic, but not outrageous. I have only had to buy one real close to the asking price. And the reason I didn't end up at asking price was during the inspection period, we found some things that were gonna cost some money to fix. We asked the seller for money off and he ended up dropping the price quite a bit. So if we did that, this is a sweet deal. We bought it for $9,000 less than they have it listed at. We didn't have to pay the closing costs. I'd do that deal. Awesome. Any questions? Great question about seeing them sight unseen too. I don't recommend that. Yep. Guys, I'm, I'm curious. I'm sorry, I got a guess a few minutes late. So we keep oh, yeah. about five percent. I know the bigger pocket black in the you know, two point five or five percent. Like who are, who's getting all loans for five percent if it's not like uh, like an SBA back loan or something? um well SBA loans are great too, but uh owner SBA is typically like ten percent, like especially on commercial stuff. Yeah. Well, owner occupied loans are the three and a half and five percent loans. So if you're not on owner occupied, so the assumption you've been making is like owner occupied, but then you said yeah. so if you're not living here, that's great income. So how are you I mean are you going in with the intention of saying I'm gonna live there but they don't check on it or something? Do you, or? No, I don't recommend that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm asking. I mean you're, you're, like you're, you're talking about five percent. I mean and I'm typically seeing, you know, ten ten or more percent on, you know twenty five on yes. multifamily. Sure. Um, yeah. I'm I'm assuming you're gonna live there for a year. <laughs> If you can't or don't want to live there, you're, it's going to be 25% down. Right. And then down, are you avoiding PMI at that point, or what's the... 25% down you are, yeah. Yeah, okay, right. At 3.5% down, PMI lives with the loan forever. For sure. With 5% down, it drops off when your equity gets 20%. Right. Yes, so, I think conventional loans are a little more favorable than FHA. I would use both of them if you're able to live in the property and have them available and want to do that. So see at 25% down, this is still a decent deal. 700 a month cash flow, almost 12% cash on cash. Today in the ask people. <laughs> Oops. But yeah, it's, I'm, I'm, a, I'm looking at these from, you're moving into it. You've got a year you have to live there. You, you can, Totally do what you want, not live there, move out after two months. I don't recommend that because if you get caught, it's a heavy fine and possible jail time. Yeah, it's fraud. I believe it is jail time. Does anybody know what the jail time associated with mortgage fraud is now? You know, it's pretty heavy. I want to say it's five plus years or something. Depends on I looked at you. That person isn't here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. So don't don't do that. If you're younger or you're able to move into an owner-occupied multifamily property, you only have to live there for a year. It's not the end of the world. It's a sweet way to get started. It's how I got started. It's how Tim, who also comes to this meetup and hosts it, got started. It's how most people I know they've gotten started, and it's just a sweet way to get in. And I'm, that's why I like to analyze it, because when you're buying it to live in, it might look like a sweet deal from the perspective of, oh, the mortgage is this much, the rent is this much, it's gonna cover this much of the mortgage. You can make a house hack work pretty easily if you don't analyze the deal completely. Like, I bet we could pull up most duplexes on the MLS right now, see what the mortgage is gonna be, see what the rent's gonna be from one side, and live for 500 bucks or less. And that's not the goal here, though. The goal is to have a great rental property when you're done. And that's really what this is about, is you really need to analyze deals to figure all this out. And if you don't analyze a deal, 
And I, I liked what you said about assumptions with uh, the down payments and the expenses. And I would talk to as many people as possible uh, about what expenses are. You know, what are, what's maintenance and capital expense typically run you? Or what is vacancy usually for you? So this is stuff you wanna know for yourself so you can analyze a deal and not rely on somebody like me to analyze a deal and tell you, oh, this is a great deal. You know, because somebody else doing it for you isn't going to have the same interest as you would analyzing a deal. You really need to know how to analyze your own deals. And, you know, I'm, I'm here to help everybody and I, I'm obviously going to do my best, but sometimes I miss stuff. You know, sometimes there's stuff I don't know or can't know. You know, the property might have a gravity furnace in it that somehow Sounds doesn't look like a gravity it's, furnace. Did you have one? I've, we had uh, fuses instead oh. of, you know, so <laughs> yeah. it turned a $3,000 electric job into 5500 which not that bad, but it could have been, you know, had they found something worse or not been too wiring underneath oh, something else, more. it could have been $10,000. Yeah. Could have been that very yeah. short, very easy. Yeah, and even when you're using an inspector too, you need to account for certain things. I've had just things that inspectors can't see. You know, a home inspector isn't a genie and can't see through walls and can't see knob and tube wiring all the time. You know, they can tell where it terminates at the box that, hey, it's probably knob and tube, but there's circumstances where they piped in Romex to it and you, it looks like, oh, it happened to you? No, uh, yeah, it was, it was knob and tube up in the attic expansion. Oh, you okay. couldn't see it until right yeah. Now. yeah, can't see it until they pull it on the wall, and then that's however many thousand dollars to take care of. So, if you're not analyzing a deal or you're not talking to other people to see what their expenses are, you can really be in a lot of trouble. And I think it, it, you do run into issues every once in a while too. It, if rental property investing was pain free and easy, there would be so <laughs> many more people doing it. Stuff happens. It's never something you can't get over. Well, the codes change too, so like yeah. the water heater goes out, now you can't put a gas water heater in because of electric. Yeah, and it's interesting you brought up the ADU thing. The 2040 plan is in process of being implemented, and they're going to start to allow you to add ADUs to properties, or to add an extra unit to properties. And when you do that, you're going to have to bring everything up to code. So, I think people are gonna to start to look at it as like, oh, it'll cost me 5,000 to add a, ba a bathroom up here and a couple thousand to do this and that. And it's like, oh no, well, wait, you have to do all the plumbing and electrical too at the same time. So we are gonna have a contractor from Denver come speak about ADUs, I think in May or June. He's very busy and is trying to figure out when he can get out here. But it's what he does in Denver is add ADUs. So, I don't know what that 2040 plan is going to look like when it's all in effect and you're able to do this stuff. I know what it sounds like and what you could possibly do, but you know it could be some potential to make a duplex a triplex or make a single family a duplex or you know make more units and it might be profitable, but you want to analyze that deal in the same way. Like, hey, I'm going to spend $70,000 adding unit here. What's my return going to be on this $70,000? For me personally, if I'm going to do improvements to a property and I don't have at least a 15% return on the money I'm spending, I'm not going to spend that money. I'd rather spend that money to go buy another property and make a 12% return and pay down a mortgage. It, when, when I'm doing repairs, I look at things a little differently or maintenance or major rehab. Or, I mean, repairs and maintenance have to happen, but a $70,000 ADU does not have to happen. So it has to really make sense. So yeah, I think that'll be, it'll be really interesting to see in the next one to three years what the 2040 plan does to Minneapolis and what its effects are and how it makes rental property investing because it could make things quite a bit different. You know, it, it, the optimistic mind that looks at it says, well, I can buy a single family and make it a duplex and it's going to be worth this much money and I'm going to make this much money off of it. My skeptical mind says, well, I'm by a single family and I'm going to have to spend a hundred grand to make it a duplex and then I'll be making 50 bucks a month and is that worth it? Probably not. So I really want to see what happens with that and that's why we're bringing somebody in to speak that has more experience with ADUs than I do. That 
go off or ring or something. <clears throat> awesome. Any more questions? A great question, though, about the 5% down, because you can't get rental properties for 5% down. If you're not living in on the 25% down for multifamily, 15% down for single. I guess I got one more. So uh, I've been talking to a guy who's doing duplexes where he, per he pur purposely doesn't rent out half of it and then Airbnb's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because he's making a lot more money on that. Sure. And, do you have any experience in that or any stories or I thoughts? Do. Or? I do. And we actually talked about this earlier. So I airbnb so I, I went kind of extreme with my first duplex. I lived in half, I rented half, I rented a room in the half I lived in. I also had a room in the back that was big enough to make into an Airbnb room. Was it San Francisco? Well, I, I just saw the highest and best use of the place and did it. And it worked out really well. It was slightly uncomfortable and weird. <laughs> it worked out really well. Um, the my TV show, do you have cameras in there? I should have. Uh, my thoughts for Airbnb right now are that Minneapolis just passed their laws and regulations last year. St. Paul's a little harder on it than Minneapolis. It, you're allowed to do it if you have a rental license in Minneapolis. You have to have rental license inspections just like everybody else, but they don't have any sort of Airbnb specific laws yet that could change at any time. So I would buy properties with the intent to use them as a long-term rental. And if you want to try an Airbnb in them, I've had great experience with it and made a lot of money. I made 60, 70 bucks a night off a porch. So, and people liked it. And especially students who needed somewhere to stay for longer periods of time and needed something more affordable than a hundred dollar a night hotel. It was great. So yeah, it, I would use it as like a plan B in case everything goes well. But personally, I wouldn't buy a property for Airbnb specific use. That's just my personal opinion and thoughts. And I know a lot of people that share similar thoughts about local laws and regulations around Airbnb changing. Because I know, you know, Louisville, Kentucky just passed certain neighborhoods they want Airbnb in, Austin, Texas pretty much banned Airbnbs in the whole city. And then uh, Florida, lots of cities in Florida are really cracking down on Airbnb. Places that are real tourist heavy seem to be real anti-Airbnb. New York City is cracking down on Airbnb, so. Bloomington is. Bloomington? Mm -hmm. Really? Bloomington, Minnesota? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really? Come all America down there. Okay, and the airport's right there too. Yeah, so. If it works as a long-term rental and you can get away with Airbnb in it for a while and make a few grand extra a year, I think it's a great idea. If, but then you need to be able to revert back just in case. That's what I would do. I, I know some people that have bought Airbnb rentals and have done really well. And luckily for them, the local laws have been favorable to Airbnb here. But Minneapolis, St. Paul seems to be not favorable to lots of things, so they might change their mind. Good question, though. Great question. Anything else? Awesome, guys. Thanks for coming. Um, I really think it was, if nothing else, you just understand that analyzing deals is important when you're looking to buy rental properties. That's a huge thing. You can't just buy rental properties by looking at the numbers or looking at the MLS or just thinking it's a good deal or somebody tells you it's a good deal. You really need to know for yourself and prove to yourself through numbers that it's a great deal. So it, whether or not you use the bigger pockets calculator, you use a spreadsheet you made yourself, there's all different kinds of ways to do it. Just run numbers on deals. Don't assume the best. Assume something fair and run numbers and you should be in a much better spot than if you just went out and bought a Fairview Avenue duplex that had one bedroom units. And it might look good on paper if you're just looking at the mortgage, but if you didn't look at all the unseen expenses here, like repair, this stuff is unseen. Repairs, CapEx and vacancy, you can't see that. That's not a hard fixed cost. You know what's hard to fix is PMI, water sewer trash well this varies a little bit not too much and property taxes so if you're just looking at that you're missing a lot of the picture and that's why 
spreadsheets like this really do a whole lot for you. And some people like to be more detailed than this. I'm, I'm okay with this. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for coming. And feel free to stick around too, guys. And we can network and talk. And yeah. Yeah.